Hey, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Melody Wickland, who is, well, basically, she has done a lot of fantasy books, and this, I guess this book, your most recent, is not a fantasy book, really. Yeah. Can you tell us more about it? Well, my most recent book is, um, it's a lesbian romance, and it's just set at a college in, and it's just a normal college. <laughs> um, and it's about this freshman student and she's coming back for the winter semester. She had kind of a rough first semester. Uh, she had a crush on her roommate and her roommate tried to kill her. Um, so now she has gotten a new roommate who is not trying to kill her, a nicer person, a friend of hers. And she's also getting a new crush on this girl who's also nicer and also not trying to kill her. But unfortunately, her old roommate is still around and still kind of obsessed with her. So while she's having this nice romance going on and she has nicer friends and all that, uh, there's still some kind of thriller stuff going on in the background. So. It's kind of a mix of some romance and some thriller stuff, but it is set in just more of a modern America kind of setting. So it's a little off my usual. Okay. And, and the name of your book is? Oh, it's called After the Fall. I guess I never mentioned that. Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Well, I think people like college romances because, well, a lot of people have been to college, so it's kind of a familiar setting. Um, if you haven't been to college, then if you're like in high school or something, then it's kind of an aspirational setting like, oh, if you go to college, things are so exciting because you're an adult. But if you have been to college, then it's like, oh, that's familiar. Everyone finds that a little bit relatable. Oh, I remember when I was in college. Um, so it's kind of a setting that a lot of people can relate to. And it's a place where a lot of people are gathered together of the same age. And so a lot of young people connect. When I was writing it, I was in college. So it was also something that was pretty closely connected to what was going on in my life. Um, to be clear, I wrote this several years ago. Um, it just was something that I didn't get around to publishing until now um, for various reasons. And I did do some edits on it more recently. So it's been through, you know, some stages. Um, but yeah, I think people like it because it's fairly relatable. In terms of like the more thrillerish and melodramatic aspects, I think people like when you take a more relatable setting but then you just kind of heighten everything and you're like, okay, so this is like, but what if I was at college, but someone was trying to murder me? And I mean, you know, we like some drama and right. <laughs> yeah, you, wouldn't like exactly, excitement. <laughs> you wouldn't exactly want to go to college and have somebody want to murder you. <laughs> you don't want it to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> now you said you were in college when you wrote the book so mm -hmm. what was the inspiration for um you know for after the fall um so i think the initial initial idea happened during a college tour like a couple years before i actually started writing it um my mom was telling me this anecdote about a college that she had visited a while before that so like i guess a whole generation ago i don't know um where if your roommate died then you would either get like free tuition or free room and board i can't remember which i think it was free tuition though i think free room and board would be more logical but i think it was just free tuition and i think i mean it's kind of a nice policy because i'm sure you would be very traumatized but it seemed kind of sinister to me. I mean, I'm sure no one would actually murder their roommate to get free tuition. But I was like, hmm, 
You could do some sketchy things. You could theoretically do some sketchy things. You could theoretically murder your roommate to get free tuition. Um, But again, nothing against a college that has that policy because you probably would be really traumatized if your roommate died while you were in college. Um, But yeah, I was thinking about that. (laughs) Of course, the whole time I was writing it, I was in college, if I told anyone I was writing this, they would just kind of look at me and they would be like, hmm, what does that say about you and your roommate's relationship? <laughs> or they'd be I'm like, hmm. you're not my roommate. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be like, so what's going on with you, Melody? <laughs> and I would be like, normal things. <laughs> so what were the steps that you took uh, to bring it from initial inspiration to the, to the final finished book? Um, well, this one, I, I didn't edit it quite as much as I edit some of the stuff that I write. Um, cause a lot of the stuff that I do, I'll do, like write and then I'll rewrite and I'll do a whole bunch of drafts. This one, I mean, I think I pretty much, um, I outlined, I wrote a draft, I rewrote some sections of it. And then I did like some line edits of it. Then I ended up letting it sit for like a good long time because I'd sent it out to some publishers, but they didn't really like it. And at that point, I wasn't really ready to do self-publishing because I was in college and I was pretty busy and I wasn't really familiar with that process at that point. And then more recently, I had tried self-publishing some other stuff. So I went back to this book and I thought, okay, maybe I'll self-publish it. So I did a few more edits then after going back to it and I finally published it then. But some of those rewrites I did. So at the time I was originally going to make it um, a heterosexual romance because the first book I had written was about a man and a woman. Um, And that was just kind of the intuitive thing for me to write because I feel like that's kind of the obvious. But when I was in college, I was realizing that I was bisexual and I started kind of wanting to write that kind of thing too um, because I was just starting to think about it. So, and also when I started writing this girl and her complicated relationship with her roommate, I decided that she had a crush on that roommate. So I was like, okay, then I want her new crush to also be a girl. We need balance. <laughs> we need balance in the universe. We need crushes on girls everywhere. <laughs> okay. So that's how it ended up being a lesbian romance too. So that ended up rewriting a lot of the book too. So that was a lot of the rewrites I did. But in the end, it didn't require me to rewrite the entire book because I hadn't finished the book when I made that decision. So it still was less editing than I ended up that I end up doing on a lot of my books. Okay. So you you self-published. Do you Mm -hmm. self-publish all of your books? No, my very first book I didn't self-publish, which is Eleven Dancing Sisters, and that's a young adult fantasy book. That one I did with a small press, which is called Every Night Teen. And so that was a bit of a different process. I had submitted it to a couple different small presses and you send out like a query letter and some other materials. And that was kind of fun because I worked with like an editor and I got to see their whole process. But most of my books I have self-published other than that. Um, Well, all of my books other than that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, this one I did self-publish. So that's kind of fun. I made my own cover and I did my own formatting and I did get some help with the editing, but I didn't have any professional editors. Um, Rather, there were a couple different people who read through it for me. Some friends, some relatives looked through it for me and they found like various places where the phrasing was awkward or where I had typos or grammar mistakes, which was really helpful because I feel like, I mean, there were things that I picked up on on my own But for me, because I wrote it, after a while, the words just start looking like words to me, and it's all mush. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so um, which did you prefer um self publishing or or publishing through an uh through a, a regular publisher I really like self publishing at this point because I I know this is kind of cliche to say but I like the control <laughs> yep um I like being able to make my own decisions about it like when I published with a small press they wanted me to change the ending of the book um oh. which is kind of a major thing and is one reason why I never ended up writing a sequel to the book because there I was originally going to make the ending of the first book I ever wrote be very indecisive in some ways and that that I don't know if it was a good decision or not but it was partly because I wanted to write a sequel and I never ended up writing the sequel because I wrote a more decisive ending now some people are annoyed at me about that um, <laughs> But I don't know if I would have ended up writing the sequel or not, so it may be a good thing. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. But these days, since I only self-publish, I may have all creative control over whatever kind of weird ending or narrative choices I make in my books and any other kinds of choices I make, like how I price my books. Whenever I want to put them on sale, I can choose that, what I want to do with the covers. Um where I want to sell them, anything I want to do, really. Um, that said, I mean, there's probably a lot I haven't experienced with uh, publishing with small publishing companies or large publishing companies. I've never published with a large publishing company, so I wouldn't write out doing it in the future. I might do it again sometime. So as far as selling your books, um, you have to do your own uh, publicity and things like that, don't you? Yeah, that's the that's one problem. I'm not very good at that, but I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. I'm so, working on it. <laughs> so, uh, do you think that um that you might that, that if there was a place that would help you um figure out how to do publicity for your own books, it would it would help. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I do hear that if you work with some publishing companies, they help you more yeah. with um, that type of thing. The one publishing company that I worked with, I didn't get a whole lot of help with that kind of thing, but I think it was probably because they were fairly small, so they might not have had a huge budget for that. Maybe larger publishing companies would have more. I don't know. It probably depends. Um, mm. I think different authors probably have different experiences with that. Uh, but as a self-published author, you definitely do have to do all of that yourself because, like, who else is going to do it for you, right? <laughs> how, how, um, do you, how do you end up doing that? Well, right now, uh, a lot social media. And then... You guys, like at Annie's and like at other small bookstores, you guys have been helpful, um, like stocking my books. And when I've been able to do some like events with you guys, it's been really nice. Um, yeah, and I've tried to like get a couple advanced reviews up for my books before I publish them. This one, I wasn't really great at that. I think I only got one advanced review up for after the fall, but usually I try to get a couple up there just so that people will be able to see what, uh, what people have to say about my book before it's published. So that if they go to the Amazon page, they'll see like that it's a real book that exists <laughs> and that people have read it. Um, cause I think that if they go to an Amazon page and they see zero reviews, they'll be like, Hmm, is it a real book? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point that, that's great you, you really need to go out and get reviews yeah. so that people can so people can look at them and, and know that it's real yeah, yeah. but yeah I'm, I'm trying to come up with different ways to publicize it but because I mean I'm still pretty new to it all so I'm still trying to come up with new ways um this weekend I'm going to do a craft fair so I want to try different ways of like trying to meet people in person too and just reaching out. I think as a self-published author, it is good to like 
connect to people locally because if I just try to do stuff online, then I'm competing with everyone in the whole world. <laughs> but if I try to do stuff locally, then maybe there's a little more luck there because I'm only competing with the people in the town. <laughs> You are local. You are a local author to Mm to near Worcester. Yeah. Yeah. And in that Okay. sense, there's less competition too, because um, we're also cooperating. So. Right. Right. Okay. So getting back to after the fall, what kind of research went into to writing after the fall, if if Um, any? yeah, I don't know if research is the right word. <laughs> I mean, it was based a lot off just what was going on in my life then, because I was writing it about a college and I was in college. Some of the locations were just locations where I had been like they were at a pizza shop. I had just been at a pizza shop. <laughs> I was like, yeah, if I was in college and I was going out to dinner, I would go to a pizza place because that's where I was last night. <laughs> it was more that kind of thing. Um Okay. But I don't know if anything was like, did I need to do any research? I guess there were a couple of things I had to Google. Like my character, my main character was more into cooking than I am because I'm not very good at cooking. So I did have to do a little research on recipes now and then. And my mom caught me on some obvious mistakes, like how long it takes to bake muffins. She was like, Melody, if you bake muffins for like an hour, they're going to burn. And I was like, what? She was like, Melody, they're going to burn. I'm like, you might be right about that, mom. <laughs> That's a failure of research. Right. <laughs> yeah, when you're when you're writing a book, you have to do the research. That's a sign I should make more muffins. <laughs> Yep, that's true. <laughs> okay. Now, for all of your books, what's your favorite research story? My Did favorite you have research any? story? Um, the most fun I've had researching probably was when I was writing a wound like Lapis Lazuli because a lot of that was based off um, Baroque Spanish painters. And I did a lot of reading on Velasquez specifically because he's my favorite Baroque Spanish painter, which is very cliche because I think he's also just the most famous Baroque Spanish painter. But I was just reading like some books about him. So I got to look at a lot of his paintings and just read what people had to say about them. And I read like a, a biography of his and some books just of people like critiquing his art and talking about like you know, art theory about his art, comparing him to this artists of his time and like before and after him. And I kind of tried to work that into the book with different artists, like my main artist, I think I tried to make a little bit similar to him. Her name's Beatrice and I made her have more realism and also more maybe like harshness in her art than some artists of her time because something about Velasquez was he was kind of, he was one of those transitional artists going into more of the Baroque period out of maybe a more Renaissance sensibility before him. Um, well, there were some artists before him that were more in the Baroque sensibility too, but him especially. Um, And then I had some other artists in the book who talk more in a more Renaissance way, who more talk about idealized art and the ideal forms, which is more of a Renaissance way of thinking of things. And so that was a lot of fun trying to weave those different art theories into the book. Um, I don't know if reading it you would necessarily say, oh, I see, she's specifically referencing Velasquez, because I don't want you to read the book and think specifically, oh, this is obviously her referencing Velasquez, because it's a fantasy world. 
but I just sure. wanted to kind of get more specific than just making up my own artsy ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. so, I wanted um, to turn something concrete. So when you when you write, do you write your character write your characters first or the plot first? Uh probably the plot. Yeah, probably the plot. And then the characters grow out of the plot and then the plot bends around them again. <laughs> yep. Okay. That so makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like, Cause I outline first and then I'll start writing it. But when I first write it, often the characters will feel kind of bland in my first draft. And I'll get dissatisfied with it. And the characters will start to come to me more clearly as I write it. And then I'll be like, okay, well, it would be better if the characters were more like this, but then I'll have to change the plot a bit to suit the characters more as they come to me more clearly. But because the characters don't come to me clearly at first, we have to have the plot first. Okay, so you, uh, you're you more of an outliner than a pantser? I guess so, yeah. No, I don't think I could really just go at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't outline as thoroughly as some people do. Um, I know some people will know like every chapter and exactly what's going to happen in it. I can't really do that. When I'm outlining a book, I might have like a page. Mm -hmm. It's usually kind of like that. But I don't like I don't like fill a notebook or anything. Well, does any I guess some people do. I don't like fill like multiple pages with notes before I go into my first draft, but I do have like a page. I have some sort of idea. Okay. So what else can we expect from you in the near future? Oh, well, I just finished the second draft of a book that I think will probably come out next spring uh, if I can get it edited in time, which I guess is kind of up in the air. Um, and that's going to be another fantasy novel because I'm back to doing fantasy. But it is going to be set in contemporary America. So it's not quite as fantastical as usual. And it's going to be about... Um, it's going to be about this girl who's she was kidnapped as a child by the fairies and she became a fairy knight. But when they kidnapped her, they left her hand behind in the human world. And so the hand is living life. It's a disembodied hand, but it's fully animated. It can live on its own and it's living with her family, specifically with her brother. And so they kind of live separate lives, but they sort of share a consciousness and they're like aware of each other. Um, and so this human comes to fairyland and meets the fairy knight and they have some adventures together. And the fairy knight brings the human back to the human land and encounters the hand's brother. And because of this, uh, the hand's brother becomes aware that his sister is still out there. And so the two worlds kind of become connected again and a little chaos ensues. And I guess that's sort of the premise of the book. Whenever I write the blurb, I'm going to have to make it a lot neater than this and I'll probably give less away. So that was kind of a lot of spoilers. Uh, it's not that many spoilers though, because that's just the first third of the book. It is oh, the first okay. third of the book, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what's been going on. Okay, uh, and that's what I've been writing. But yeah, okay. and that's that's probably going to come out next spring if I can get it together. Okay, so uh, now I have questions about you as a writer. What do you consider yeah. the most challenging part about? writing of the whole writing process and how did you overcome that probably edits um not like not like rewriting edits like rewriting is okay but like line edits like the edits where you're just working on like phrasing I think that's kind of hard because I have no patience with it and 
you know, it requires a lot of focus. You can't, it's not the kind of thing that you can do with your inhibitions down. I think you can write first and second drafts when you're really tired, but you can't do that when you're editing because you'll look at a paragraph and you'll be like, yeah, that's fine. It's beautiful. It's great. There's no problems there. And the more tired I get, the more I'll just be like that when I look at a paragraph. And if you're doing that, then you know you're not doing good editing. So any other type of writing I can do like after a full day of work, but I have a hard time editing after a full day of work. I really can't do more than like a page or two of editing. Um, so just in terms of like time, there's only so much time I can spend editing at a time. And it's a bit of an issue because say the book that I just said I'm working on, it's like I printed it out and it's about 270 pages, like Times New Roman 12 point font. If I can only edit like two pages of it a night, it's going to take me so long to edit. <laughs> uh -huh, a long time. <laughs> and it's not super, super challenging in terms of like mentally or like whatever. It's just that like you have to focus and you have to have high standards and my standards drop rapidly. In the first couple of minutes, I'll be like, yeah, that sentence needs to be shorter. Yeah, that phrasing is a little awkward. But after a few minutes, I'll be like, you know, that phrasing is fine. <laughs> it's good if you can have someone help you also. But uh, so much of it comes down to taste. And you do want it to kind of be your own taste in the end because you want the book to be in your own style. And mm -hmm. you'll end up disagreeing with the person anyway about at least half of what they say. So it's not really fair to them to make them edit it too much. So, and if you like, you can hire someone to go through it, but that's pretty expensive. So I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging just in terms of like time, but I don't know. It gets done. It gets done eventually. It's really annoying. Um... <laughs> But it, it'll get done. Maybe I'm just annoyed about it right now because it's the next thing I'm going to have to do. Um, thank you for letting me complain. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <clears throat> Some people love editing and other people say, uh. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't really understand people who love editing, but I know they're out there. <laughs> I've met them um, and they do exist. And it's good for them. <laughs> okay. They're not me. <laughs> My next question is, what is your favorite part of writing? <laughs> and uh, on the whole writing and publishing process. Um, I like the part where I'm writing. <laughs> yep. Okay, that's a little bit silly. Um, I think everyone likes, well, this is not, everyone because we just agreed that some people like the editing but I like the days where you're like just in the flow of things you know where you're like just sitting down and you're like you know you're just vibing you're just concentrating the words aren't exactly coming to you but like because I feel like if you say that then it sounds like it's like coming to you from a higher power or something <laughs> but they're just coming out pretty easily and just in the way of like they're coming to you the way that it's easy for me to speak to you right now um it's easy to like communicate what you're trying to say mm -hmm. um i think that's nice and and like when you're writing a scene that's like enjoyable not necessarily like a climactic scene I feel like climactic scenes are never quite as exciting to write as they are to read because so often the fun. No, that's not exactly it. Climactic scenes often actually have to be kind of sparse because you don't really want to make them too, too, too many words because then you kind of diminish the 
impact, you know? But when you're in the flow of things, you want to write a lot of words. So maybe what's more fun is when you're writing just a casual conversation and people are just kind of talking to each other and it's a less important scene and you're just kind of writing one of those transitional scenes and it's like mildly important, but it's not super important. And they're just kind of talking. I think that's, like, that's nice. <laughs> so you like the dialogue scenes? Yeah. Yeah. I like a dialogue scene. <laughs> Okay. So what has been your favorite adventure <clears throat> while writing? That's a good question. Uh, well, hmm. Going back to a wound like Lapis Lazuli again, this isn't actually about the writing of it. But I think when I first got inspired to write it, really, was probably when I was visiting Spain, um, which was an adventure. I don't know if it was it counts as a writing adventure because writing was not why I was there. I was just studying abroad. But it feels connected to the book in my head because I was thinking about it a lot when I was there. And especially when I was in the cathedrals, they're kind of tied together a lot in my head. Um, so we could call it that, I mm -hmm. guess. So going to Spain? Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, apart from the fact that, like, Publicity is hard, which we've already talked about. Um, maybe the fact that, like, you can't really predict what people are going to like in your writing. I feel like when you're writing, you know how I just said that it's really nice when you're in the flow of things? When you're in the flow of things, you think what you're writing is good. Um, <laughs> You think that when you're having a good writing day, like, you think that what you enjoy writing is, like, good stuff, right? And also, you might also think that, like, what you agonize over writing must be the best stuff. Basically, you think you know, you know about what's good writing. But often the stuff that people like isn't the stuff that you thought was good. Like, people usually like dumb jokes that I make sometimes the stuff that people mention is just like the last paragraph that I write um because it was the last thing that I wrote so it's just the last thing that hit them which makes you realize how important it is to write a good ending which I'm not very good at um so maybe that's something for me to work on um or they'll mention how funny my book is which isn't something I think very much about. I don't usually consider my books to be very humorous, but apparently they are. So I guess you can't really predict how people see your work. And that's kind of interesting to me. That is interesting, yeah. Um, so what piece of advice would you wanna, uh, would you wanna share with other writers? Uh, don't edit so much. <laughs> do less editing. <laughs> well, no, I mean, do some editing, but don't do as much editing on like your first draft. Um, just, just like write a draft. And then once the draft is done, it's easier to see what needs to be done because you have like the whole thing. Right. But I know that not everyone can work that way. And for some people, that's really impossible. Like, I know that some people, they like to have, they like to just write one draft, which I find equally impossible. Um, like, I really can't do that. But they like to have, like, a first draft that's, like, almost perfect by the time it's done 
But I think it's good if you can just complete a first draft and then edit it afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I, I've heard from quite a mm-hmm. few authors that, yeah, just get it, get it written, get it out, yeah. you know, get it done and then you can fix it later. Yeah. <laughs> but I also just hate editing. So that again, might just be my personal bias speaking. <laughs> If you can avoid it, why would you do it? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I have questions about you as a person. What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Oh, no. Um, I don't know. I don't have a lot of secrets. <laughs> um, I like asparagus. <laughs> Does that count? (laughs) Sure. I think most people do, actually. I really like frogs. (laughs) Okay. It's good. (laughs) It's fine. Frogs may be my favorite animals. I was at the zoo yesterday. Wait, no, that wasn't yesterday. Not anymore. I was at the zoo two days ago. And I saw some frogs there. They were poison dart frogs, and they were great. Wow, yeah, those are pretty, though, aren't they? Yeah. But also normal frogs are very good. All right, that's all I have to say about frogs. I know a lot about frogs. They're one of my favorites. Really? Yep, (laughs) I do. Nice. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) So what is or are your passions when you're not writing? And how do you make time for your non-writing hobbies or for your writing hobbies and things that you love? Um, I like watching Korean and Chinese dramas and I like knitting. And one way to make time for both of these things is to do both of them at the same time, which is... I don't knit very complicated things. So if I'm watching a drama, I can also knit. Um. (laughs) Good idea. If you're a multitasker. (laughs) But also I just, I mean, I do try to write most days. I don't really write every day. But I might write like four days a week usually or more if I can. Um, But I don't I try not to write too late at night because otherwise I can't really sleep. So if I'm trying to like unwind a little bit, then I might watch an episode of a drama before I go to bed and knit at that time. And that's more of like an unwinding thing for me. Okay. So while you're writing, um, do you prefer music or silence or what? And if it's music, what kind of music? Um, Well, a lot of the time I don't end up listening to music because I forget to put any on and I just sat down and start writing without really thinking about it. But I do like music because if I like put on a playlist, then... I have this kind of attitude in my head where I'll tell myself as long as the music is playing, I am not allowed to like change tabs and be doing something else on my computer. So it's good for my focus that way. Um, Yeah, recently there's a couple different singers that I've been listening to a bit. I've been listening to a lot of Hosier. I really like his new album, Unreal on Earth. Um... Also a little bit of Marina and the Diamonds, some Lord. Um, Yeah. Also, going back to the Korean dramas, sometimes I'll listen to the soundtrack of a Korean drama when I'm writing. And that's kind of good because I don't understand the words to any of the singing. So if I really need to like completely be zoned out and not distracted at all, it can be kind of helpful. Right. So what does your writing space look like? It's just a desk. (laughs) 
it's a little bit messy um, right now. There's some stuff piled up. There's some notebooks and stuff, some pens and pencils. It's not particularly neat, uh, but it's just a desk. Okay. And writers very often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions to help them through their work. And do you have any? And uh, what do you have? And do they help or hinder you? Hmm, I don't have any pets. Uh, Maybe someday. I wish I had okay. a frog. <laughs> They do not say ribbit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any favorite foods or drinks that must be in the vicinity when you're when you're writing or editing? Not really. Um yeah, no, I don't really like having food or drinks on my desk. Sometimes I'll like go downstairs to get a drink of water, and if anything, that's a good excuse to stretch my legs. Right. Okay. Um, how important has the New England setting been to any of your books? Or has it? I don't know if I've ever used specifically a New England setting. Even the ones that have been set kind of in a vague American setting, I don't think I really specified. So I guess not. Okay. Maybe I, I should just... get more specific someday. Okay. Um, I just have two more questions for you. Where can people find your books aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? <laughs> and uh, they should definitely check there first. And if you want to, uh, if you want to order Melody's book, you can call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can you find Melody's book, your books? Well, you can find them online. Um, after the fall specifically, apart from getting them at your bookstore, uh, I think it's really only available on Amazon because I put it in Kindle Unlimited. Um, but yeah, it is also at your bookstore. Um, my other books are available, you know, wherever books are sold. So apart from Amazon, you know, you can get through like Barnes & Noble, Kobo, generally the normal bookish websites. Um, what was the other question? That was it. That was where it. Can, okay. Yeah. We're good. Very we're good. Good. Then, yeah, books. that that's where you can find them. Okay. And um, my last question is how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So um probably Instagram is where I've been the most active recently, although still not very active. I need to get back on that. Um, but yeah, you can follow me at Melody Wickland. It's just Melody Wickland. There's no spaces or anything. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I am also on Facebook. I don't really post there very much. Um, and I'm also on TikTok again at Melody Wickland. Okay. And on Facebook, is it Melody Wickland or Melody Wickland author? Uh, it's just Melody Wickland again. Okay. Pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Melody, thank you very much for, for taking the time with me and uh and good luck with After the Fall and, and your other books. And right. uh, and I know you've you've come into our store before to, to do mm -hmm. a uh, to do a uh, autograph session. And uh well maybe we'll see you again. Oh yeah, that would be nice. And thanks for having me, Selena. It's a lot of fun, and it's great seeing you again. Yep, I should come by the too. bookstore sometime soon. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will be uh, we'll be seeing you. All right.